Welcome to the June meeting of the WebRTC Working Group. The group abides by the W3C patent policy and only people and companies listed at the link are allowed to make substantive contributions. So uh, today we'll be covering a couple of things, the WebRTC DC revision process uh, and charter, media capture extensions, the ICE controller API, uh, some WebRTC and media capture main issues. We have some future meetings that we should chat about. We have a meeting on July 16th, but we've had discussion on the list of whether sh we should cancel that meeting because a number of people are away, either on travel or vacation. Uh, and instead, we've created a meeting on August 27th. Uh, are there objections to canceling the July 16th meeting? Anybody who prefers that to August 27th? Okay, we'll probably go ahead and cancel the July meeting then. So a little bit about this meeting, the slides link is up on the working group wiki. We do need a scribe. Do we have a volunteer? I wouldn't call that a volunteer, but I'll do it. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, and as Harold noted, the meeting is being recorded and will be made public. We operate under the W3C Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct, so we're all passionate, but uh, let's try to keep it cordial and professional. Probably folks understand how to work Google Meet, but uh, raise your hand to get into the queue and lower your hand to get out of it. And of course, wait for microphone access before speaking and use headphones if you can, state your name. Thank you. All right, just a little bit about document status. Just because something's in a repo doesn't impl imply we've adopted it. We have a process for that. And also for making sure that the documents describe what is consensus and what isn't. So here's today's agenda. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, Dom talking about the revision process as well as the charter. Uh, then we have some time for media capture extensions. Uh, Amir will talk about the ICE controller API. And then we'll have some time for Weber CPC and media capture main issues. The agenda is a little less packed than it usually is. So we probably don't have to be that strict about time. Uh, so uh, we should have more than enough time for everything uh, that's on the agenda today. All right, so we're going to turn the floor over to Dom. <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi everyone. A uh, couple of uh, more process-oriented questions uh, to start the meeting today. Um, as hopefully most of you are aware, uh, we are operating on the policy we adopted a couple of years ago to uh, bring new features or changes to the WebRTC recommendation, uh, which uh, is documented in the so-called merge guide uh, document. Um, and the overall process, as you probably know, is that we develop new features in the WebRTC extensions uh, repo, where they land once uh, they've uh, gained enough consensus. Um, and the current policy says that we can bring them over to the main uh, WebRTC specification, the one that was published as a recommendation, once they have gained uh, enough uh, test coverage and we have at least two passing implementations. Um, and I've been proposing a few weeks ago that we uh, lighten a bit that requirement. Uh, first, because uh, we did it informally in some cases already, uh, the uh, changes to the 
RTC ICE uh, candidate interface, for instance, haven't gotten implementations yet, but they, they are already in the spec. But more fundamentally, uh, the WebRTC e extension uh, document uh, has this fuzzy status. It's not really a spec, it's a collection of uh, features. Um, and that can create confusion and also reduce uh, the integration that we get when we publish stuff in a proper specification. Um, and so what I think it's okay is that we do uh, experimental ideas development in the extensions repo. I suggest that once we have enough signals that something is in fact uh, gaining uh, traction, it's more than ID, it's something that is getting implemented at maybe different pace, but uh, getting implemented that we move it over uh, the main uh, document. And practically speaking, what I mean by that is if a feature uh, has indeed test coverage, uh, one implementation and a clear implementation commitment from another uh, implementer, that should be sufficient signal to bring uh, a feature from the extension repo to the main repo. Um, so that's the proposal on the table. Uh, and uh, I sent this to the list again a few weeks ago, and I wonder if anyone uh, has any objection to taking that approach. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I agree that the extension specs are, have been confusing. And so in theory, uh, I just want this might work. Uh, I just want to make sure that I understand that that it's uh, if uh, my understanding is correct, this is there's no change to the charter from this. Is that correct? Uh, right. This is purely an internal policy, right. so we can uh, revise it whenever we want anyway. So this seems fine to me if I'm reading the process right, that amend amendments appear to, to me to have the status of working draft ahead of last call for review of proposed amendments. Is that correct? Um, yes, although whether it's working draft or candidate recommendation, I think it's probably debatable, but, but uh, overall, okay. uh, <clears throat> They are not. They don't have the same status until they get through the last call review mm -hmm. and the final AC review of that last call. Right. So there's a last call to catch. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes. So the only downside here, I think, is that it might cause confusion by people only looking at TR and assuming that everything there is gold. But uh, I, I do support getting away from the extension specs sooner. So uh, uh, I don't have a, an immediate objection to this. So to, to be clear, the TR, at least at the moment, the TR version of the WebRTC spec isn't uh, updated automatically from the editor's draft. Uh, we could do that, um, but we don't at the moment. <clears throat> so the, the risk of Considering considering everything under TR as golden uh, doesn't actually apply today, uh, and more structurally, even if you were doing automatic publication, any such uh, amendment is clearly marked as such in the TR version. So it would be really hard for anyone to be confused about the fact that they are not uh, of the same nature of the rest of the document. So uh, I have a follow up since there's no one else on the queue. Uh, what does this mean for media capture main, which also has an extension spec? Is it possible for media capture main to go to rec? Is there an allowance in the process to go to rec with amendments? Uh, yes, it's absolutely a possibility. It's something I've already did a few times before. Uh, so if we wanted to bring more of the extension stuff into main, even though they don't have two implementations, we could start annotating them as uh, candidate additions and have them blessed as such when we go to recommendations. This, this hasn't been done before, but I've asked the question of whether this was uh, doable and I got a very 
clear okay so i, I don't expect this will be problematic right thanks uh, bernard yeah i have a question about the impact of this on the test coverage so you say uh, so it's reasonable test coverage to get into WebRTC DC, but presumably by the time it gets to recommendation, it would be a, a higher bar. Like for example, we've been uh, annotating the tests in the spec. So I'm just trying to understand, you know, when we merge something, will there be higher bars at various points, and will be will people have an obligation to do additional work? And if so, how we track that? So my, my personal interpretation of reasonable test coverage, I, I don't know that we've ever been very specific about it. My, my personal interpretation is that basically enough test coverage that we feel we know we have an implementation on it, which is basically the bar we've also been using uh, to go to uh, propose recommendation uh, or to recommendation. So I, I would say, from a testing perspective, my assumption is that we only want to bring things where we don't have just a test that says uh, this feature exists, but that we feel the test covers enough of the features that we feel passing them gives us uh, reasonable confidence. Thanks. Uh, Tim? Is there any scope for, for broadening the definition of um, implementation? I mean, I'm, I, so I think I said at the last meeting, I, I'm starting to see people who, outside the context of a, of a browser, are using this API. Um, is, it, is, is it interesting to say kind of one implementation one in-browser implementation commitment or one outside browser implementation as the sort of secondary feature. I mean, I, I agree we need, there's no point in doing this unless we've got it at least implemented in one browser, that's clear. But I think it would be nice to try and have, give a signal that, that we do know that other, other people are using this API and, and kind of that we value that and that it counts towards some of our metrics. Does that make any sense? Um, so I'll react and I'll, I think any of maybe want to react. Um, so for, from my perspective, I, I'm not proposing we change our assumptions in terms of what constitutes an implementation based on that particular policy. I think the, the question you're asking is a, a fair one to ask, but not specific to, to that policy. Um, my personal sense is that uh what we are trying to achieve in this group is enabling interoperability between browsers a side effect and a great one to my mind a side effect is that we also bring these capabilities in other in some cases runtimes that are based on javascript in some cases in other languages that are not necessarily javascript but that want to stick to the same uh, api shape uh, it also usually has consequences on to the uh, LibWebRTC open source project, which is another thing that the broader community can benefit from. But in terms of the specific uh, scope and mission of this working group, uh, I think sticking to uh, uh, implementations in browsers as being or uh, clear as threshold, not the only signal, but the, the one that we feel as determining whether we have uh, cleared the path to recommendation or not. Uh, uh, at least at this stage, it feels to me uh, the better approach w without at all uh, dismissing the value of the other implementations. But to me, they are orthogonal uh, to the process bits of this particular working group. Yeah, I think Tom answered my my concern there, and I would agree that uh, I would not wish to extend the definition of implementations here, because I think when you say this API, uh, that requires a lot of hand waving to apply that to something other than a JavaScript API, the way 
things are structured. So uh, plus one to keeping that definition. Uh, Yuan? Uh, yeah, what is the implementation commitment? Uh, because uh, on our side, we could have commitment that we, we want to implement the API. And then we have like a, a schedule and sometimes the schedule might have might change and then uh, it, like one year we sleep and we'll we'll still not have implemented what we want to implement and that that's happening so uh, i wonder what is what, what, what we should do there and what's the definition of commitment so my, my personal sense of that commitment and, and that's something that uh, for instance uh, is being used as a signal in the uh, what would g process but my personal sense is clarity that this is not uh, one implementation thing uh, other at least another implementer is on board uh, when it will land is uh, may or may not be clear uh, but it's clear that they want it so maybe they have a standard position maybe they have a bug which uh, tracks the, the, the topic and is clear that this is somewhere on the roadmap even if exactly where uh, is unspecified but that uh, it's not again not something that still has a fuzzy status in terms of at least having two independent uh, implementers being interested. Um, I don't think we need to be super specific about uh, that signal. Basically, our, our process of integrating it in the, in the main spec would be getting that on the record essentially that uh, indeed we have one implementation and that's demonstrable and we have uh, at least one other implementer on the record saying that's on our roadmap uh, harold yeah so um, the 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 change will go, will go into the main spec as uh can they candidate amendment and so the we still keep the two implementations uh, and consensus requirement for advancing the it, the candidate amendment to rec right uh that's right yes yes so uh, so it's more 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 of housekeeping than uh, anything else what we want to lock on is probably the the case where one browser vendor insists that this is flight spread and uh, and all other browser vendors say, say that, that no, this is bad, a bad idea well, and will never implement it. And there's all sorts of debates about uh, what to do with specs that have not been implemented. Uh, for, for other, in other places, but I, I, I think this is okay. We, it does not block us from tossing things out again. But isn't it blocking us potentially uh, from going to see our regularly? If one feature is uh, like if we delay implementing one feature and we and for all the other features we have to implementation, then we we are blocked to go to uh, so block on CR for both features. To, to so clarify, th th this policy, at least as it is described today, is for post-rec life. So the going to CR bit isn't uh, actually an issue. We were discussing it, uh, d discussing applying it to media capture main. Uh, in that case, technically, they would be marked as feature at risk uh, during CR. And for the publication as, as recommendation, we would then have them as candidate amendment uh, from the first day of the recommendation rather than being a, a purely post rec thingy. So there is even a path for, for that particular situation. Again, it's not a well-trodden one, so we probably will have to uh, create it once and if we want to take it. But at least in the context of the post rec life, uh, I don't think that's a concern. It just means that some of these candidates additions will remain candidate until we have the uh, level of implementation we want to go for the final uh, uh, approval by the advisory committee but, that, but that's nothing new that's the way uh, would happen in any other 
recommendation track this question in WCC. Yeah, my reading of this is also that this is a time optimization going from a two implementation requirement down to one implementation plus one future commitment to implement. So I think we want to be clear that it's not sufficient to point to participation in the working group, for example. It would have to be something stronger like a standards position. Uh, I think we have standards position repos and that kind of stuff to get. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's basically a stopgap, as you said, for uh, any browser just going it alone. I think that's uh, uh, a valid optimization, time optimization here. That seems safe. Sounds like we have no opposition to trying this. So. That's an internal rule. If it turns out to create problems, we can change it. Okay, so I'll document that as resolved. Uh, proceed with adopting a new match guide uh, guidance. Well, anyway, um, the second process bit is that our charter is expiring uh, end of September, right after DPAC, uh, which might also be an opportunity to remind you all that we will be meeting at DPAC. Um, Based on the discussions with the chair so far, uh, the plan is to do uh, uh, basically minimal rechartering, uh, only updating the list of uh, deliverables and aligning with the expectation of the charter templates. Um, so unless I hear otherwise, I'll be proceeding with that plan. Uh, we already sent an advance notice. I haven't heard any pushback. I notified the list also a few weeks ago and haven't heard anything. Um, so if there is any discussion now would be a good time because then we need to uh, take into account the time it takes to uh, actually go through the various rechartering steps. Mm. I'm happy with uh, continuing with the current charter. Okay, I don't see anyone jumping to get on the queue. I see some plus one, so I'll take this that. Uh, this is how we will be proceeding with this. And that's the end of the process bit for today. Thank you all. Thank you, Dom. Okay, we're now on to the media capture extensions part of the agenda. And this is what's for discussion today. I guess uh, we've got one item from Jianzhen and one from Yuan. Jianzhen, you have the floor. Uh, hi, uh, this issue is about adding uh, new events uh, media stream truck for audio. So, um, uh, the, the background of this uh, issue is uh, we find some uh, video conferencing applications uh, like uh, Teams and uh, Zoom uh, gives user a notification like uh, your microphone is muted uh, when the user is speaking and the microphone is muted. Uh, and uh, uh, from the Chrome tracing, uh, we find that uh, um, application uh, has a worklet uh, which runs uh, every about, about uh, every 10 milliseconds uh, for the audio processing uh, to detect audio activities. So um, uh, we think that uh, if uh, the the browser can provide uh, APIs like uh, uh, some two events like uh, uh, voice activity start and the voice activity end, uh, then the application doesn't need to uh, process audio by themselves. Uh, which can simplify uh, the application logicals and also um, benefit uh, uh, power efficiency. Um, and uh, uh, we got a uh, comment from Yuan 
uh, that uh, this feature uh, should be um, enabled only when uh, constraints for VAD is enabled for the uh, specific truck. So I think this is a good comment. Um, and uh, I want to know uh, uh, if the working group agrees to add such uh, events or not. Yeah, Ian? Uh, yes, um, so first on the motivations, uh, the hint to unmute the microphone, uh, that's uh, a great use case. Um, we do want to motivate websites to actually fully mute uh, microphone uh, and camera uh, through the media session API and have a way for websites to know that the user is speaking while actually muting capture is, uh, is a good idea. It, it is supported in iOS and macOS. Um, and I believe we, we need to, uh, to fix it uh, to have the media session API uh, um, mute, unmute uh, solution to be a full solution. Um, so there is OS support so already. So I think that we are good in terms of implementation as well. Uh, so I think it's a valid motivation there. Uh, for the process audio, only when user is actively, actively speaking, uh, I'm, I'm less sure because by the time you have the event that is fired, maybe you already missed some important audio bits. So there, I, I'm, I'm less I'm less sure about uh, that, but um, maybe we, we, we should discuss this. Uh, just to mention that on macOS, uh, you can get events that the uh, um, speaker is speaking, uh, whether the microphone is muted or not. But on iOS, currently it's only supported if the microphone is muted. So when the microphone is not muted, uh, iOS is not uh, giving that information uh, at least yet. So that might be a restriction uh, in terms of voice support. Uh, thanks for the information about uh, OS implementation. And uh, uh, Jen, Eva? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um... Yeah, so again, the, the first use case, I think, I, I'm kind of wondering if these are two different events, or, or sorry, if these are two different use cases, because it might be problematic to fire start and end events every time someone speaks when the microphone is muted. That might be a privacy concern. Um, but I do strongly support the first use case. I think a single um, a hint to a single event that basically said, are you speaking now, uh, is something that existing applications implement and is currently demotivating them from moving to muted because, uh, so I agree that would be a benefit. Um, and that would almost be, I don't know, even think you'd need a constraint to, to do that perhaps, but it might be, uh, but perhaps if it, it's uh, on or some implementations to provide that. Um, as far as voice activity, we do already have, in WebRTC, we have get synchronization sources, uh, which is for a remote endpoint that exposes audio levels and that kind of stuff. And I'm wondering um, if you looked at that and found that insufficient because this is sender side. Is that correct? Uh, I think the audio level is for RTP sender, mm. right? It's yeah. not a uh, receiver, yeah. So, yeah, so for audio processing, I'm still not sure, but I'll let other people in the queue to speak to it. Yeah, I think I'm uh, next yeah, so there's, there might be use cases for exposing such information, for instance, as audio stats or something like that. Uh, for instance, there's an RTP head extension where you can actually uh, set a Boolean, which is voice activity or not. Uh, I think the implementation currently is that the encoder is actually responsible to uh, set that value. But I guess there, we, we could also think that this uh, V bit there could also be uh, um, set by this, inf this information there, which 
So it, it might make sense to also provide that information uh, on, on, re on a real-time basis. Uh, but I, I'm not sure the event there is the, the I, I'm not sure yet whether it's a good idea or not to uh, fire events um, based on that. We, we need to do some experiments there. Yeah, um, I have a, pri I think we need to think carefully about privacy issues here because, you know, the user thinks they're muted and we don't want the app to be able to basically determine what they're saying. And uh, in that regard, I think having both voice activity start and end is potentially problematic because you could you could understand the, the length of time they were speaking and might be able to recover some of the speech. So I, I would say just, just a voice activity event. Don't tell us how long that speech occurred. The other thing is that uh, Yanni Bar was talking about the um, activity levels and stuff like that. I, I don't think you want to be firing voice activity uh, level information while the mic is is muted. I don't think that's a good idea. Uh. Uh, if we only have a single uh, voice activity start event, uh, then when should we fire another event uh, if the user is muted and um, and unmuted again? Well, again. You, you could say you could fire it again within a certain interval. Um, and uh, because I think for the use case, you, you don't really need to know how long the voice activity was. You just need to essentially know that someone's speaking. And I, I don't know that the interval needs to be particularly small because what you're going to use it for, right, is just to, to have some kind of toast or something. So it, it's, it's, it's not, um, it, it's just for the UI. So maybe like every second or a couple of seconds, I don't know. Okay, so uh, for the first use case, I think it's okay. But for the second use case, if we only have a uh, start event, it looks like uh, the application still needed to process audio, uh, even uh, there is no audio activity because the application doesn't know uh, when the user starts to speak. Okay, so uh, I think the next uh, one is Tony. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if a simple Boolean, just voice activity or not, is sufficient for applications to give the like hint to unmute? Because to some extent, it depends on how aggressive the warning is, right? If you're being more aggressive, then maybe you need like a higher confidence that it's actually the user speaking rather than something that sounds like speech or something in the background. So yeah, is is a boolean enough? Do you think? Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I uh, I am not quite sure about uh, what is the uh, API look like eventually. So uh, today, firstly, I want to know if the working group agrees to have such a, an API or an event, and then uh, I think we can uh, think about. Uh, uh, how it should be implemented. So thanks for your suggestion. Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, T. Yeah, I, I just, um, I think to echo that point, I think we need to be clear about whether this is a voice detection or whether this is audio level. Like, I think, Kind of the two use cases you've got have different requirements there. I think the first one is pretty clearly really only about voice. Um, and the better it can distinguish voice, the more useful the API is. Whereas I think the second one, actually you you want to catch singing and you want to catch, you know, group of people talking and that kind of stuff. So I think it feels like these are two APIs with different requirements in terms of whether they are voice or audio level is that like so i think this is two um, apis my initial thought uh, is there is only uh, one api that is uh, to indicate uh, whether a uh, user is speaking so uh, when we have this information uh, we can uh, give user a notification to unmute 
or we can start uh, uh, processing audio. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, as uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, some uh, um, other use cases uh, like audio uh, might be lost before processing. Uh, so it looks like uh, I need to think it think about it again. So, but uh, basically, I I want a, a, uh, my initial thoughts is about uh, it's just a uh, boolean, a true or false, doesn't need to be audio level. So uh, me again, thinking about this a little more, I, I, this seems like two disparate, uh, separate uh, use cases that I I think it's a mistake to try to think that they re require the same solution. I think for the first one, we probably want a single event, just to update UI. Uh, that only is fired while the microphone is muted. <laughs> Excuse me. And for the second one, I think I'm not sure you want an event to fire on main thread because depending on where you're processing audio, if it's in an audio worklet or a uh, media stream track processor or something like that, um, you probably want that just as metadata to the audio somehow, whether and, and maybe control even when the JavaScript is being called. Uh, to process and so that doesn't seem to fit with a main thread event for me. So I, I would think we can make more progress. Maybe we should address these separately in parallel. Does that make sense? Uh, thanks. And and I'm okay to uh, firstly resolve the first use case. Uh, uh, I also yeah I also agree with Johnny Bar. Uh, these are different use cases the first one uh, you're mostly interested when the track is muted the second one you're interested uh, when the track is not muted and that could be an audio stat like a new audio stat and you, you, you gather it from there uh, i'm not sure how much it's useful because uh, you might want to have that in the audio worklet uh, maybe not in in the uh, main thread but uh that's still useful information because usually an echo canceller is is uh, actually computed by information. So we have this information somehow. Exposing to the web may uh, allow some optimizations, uh, but it, I'm still unclear precisely uh, how uh, or which in optimization that could be. So separating the two issues and uh, fast moving faster on the first uh, hint to unmute and taking it some more time for the second process audio might might be a great idea. Thanks, and I agree, so. And uh, Harold. And so, uh, uh, good point about uh, the first one is only interesting when you otherwise don't have the audio. The second one is uh, when you, is to avoid processing and you can get half of that benefit by simply, if you have a JavaScript processing of frames, you can get some benefit from just looking at the frame and seeing if it contains zeros. And if it's just zeros, then you can skip it. Um, of course, that's a little overhead and you have to be past the frame and you have to, have to inspect it, but uh, still, the benefit seems a bit marginal. Okay, so it looks like we should uh, go to uh, solve the first uh, use case first and uh, see um, if we can. Um, so the second use case can be um, uh, solved by a different uh, uh, solution, or we can uh, firstly check uh, um, how uh, this worklet uh, um, has a uh, power has how much power in, in impact, I think. Um, so from a process point of view, I want to make sure our notes are clear. Are we saying that the first use case is potentially ready for PR? And the second one needs maybe should be separated out into a different issue. And then we can figure out when that one is ready for PR. Just trying to make sure we're clear on the next step. I'm seeing thumbs up. Does that mean that I what I said should be put in the notes?
So I think the yeah, guidance to Tian Chan is, is clear now, right? Is that correct? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so, all right. So on to 149, you win. Uh, thanks, Ronald. Um, so going to cameras now, and uh, we, we've made some measurements on, on iOS. Uh, so on iOS and macOS as well, um, to start capturing camera, the first thing you need to do is to select a preset. And the preset will have a resolution, it, it will have a frame rate and so on. So you set it. And that's what the camera will actually capture. And then um, to fully match what the web application might want, you might need to resize uh, or you might need to uh, drop frames to uh, to, to achieve a specific uh, resolution of frame rate, and that's fine. And what what we saw is that uh, some camera presets uh, are much more power efficient than others, and uh, it has some trade offs, um, like in terms of quality, like the autofocus might be a little bit uh, less good, or the quality might be a slightly less good uh, than other presets. Uh, but for, let's say, video conference situations, usually uh, it's a good trade-off to, to use uh, these presets that are power efficient. Uh, while if you are doing like a podcast or maybe uh, scanning a, a barcode or so on, you want the best quality for a short amount of time. Um, as a user agent, we do not have good, really great ways uh, of uh, knowing whether it's for video conferencing or whether the web application wants power efficiency or the quality. Um, so I, I was wondering whether we could let web applications provide a hint to user agents so that they could select these uh, power, power efficient camera presets. And we already have power efficient pixel format, which is somehow similar, but somehow different uh because it's uh targeting uh like should i select motion jpeg uh pixel format or sh should i select uh, where you with pixel format which is somehow different but it's somehow related to the idea that yeah i want to set up that is power efficient ne next slide um i think we we discussed when uh when uh, designing power efficient pixel format whether we should have a simple power efficient or whether we, we want a, a more precise power efficient pixel format. Um, so I think it's good to have to have a way for the web application to provide a hint. Um, and I, I could see two options. Um, first one is to create a, a new constraint. And the second one is just to say that uh, if a web application is setting power efficient pixel formats, then the user agent may or should or uh, could uh, use like um, camera presets that are power efficient. And basically, it's just it's no change to the spec except it's a hint. So, thoughts? Yeah, Dom. Uh, yeah, I looked into the implementations of power efficient pixel format the other day, and it looks like we have none. So I think uh, if that's indeed the case, uh, maybe people can confirm or infirm it, um, then maybe we can replace it all together uh, because that wouldn't break anything. So. so you mean a simple power efficient constraint instead? Uh, for instance, again, I mean, we, we came up with the power efficient pixel format with mm -hmm. uh, a specific use case, so we would need right. to check that this wouldn't lose it, but uh, maybe that was too specific, and really what we are after is optimizing uh, power efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, Bernard? Yeah, I think I'm more inclined towards option two because uh, I assume it might be possible to ask for a power efficient precept, but not get the power efficient pixel format. That is that possible? Um, maybe. Uh, in, I I don't think that in uh, macOS or iOS uh, we have ways to get. Maybe maybe I don't know. 
Uh, I wouldn't so. necessarily conflate them that just because you got the power efficient that that's that's everything anyway. So so you're saying a different constraint, not making power efficient pixel format more general. Uh, well, I, I think you you'd be you'd be asking for uh, the the power efficient presets. You'd be biasing towards that. Give. Um, and I'm, I wouldn't necessarily assume that you'd get everything. Is I guess what I'm saying. Um, okay. Yeah. You, I mean, it, it's a request. If it could give you the power pix efficient pixel format, it would do that in addition to the presets. But I don't. I don't want to. I don't think it's their equivalent necessarily. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, this actually reminds me of uh, content. Uh, content hints in that you're you don't want to specify exactly what to do but you want to specify that you're pushing pushing the the ua decision in a certain direction so uh, i think that power efficient pixel format is uh, is uh, too constrained and since it's not implemented it's uh, cheap to start a new one to uh, to capture the thing better so we might we might want to have a have a some kind of constraint that says uh, says uh, power quality trade off and uh, with possible values uh, power or quality something like that but uh, i do think we should have abandon power efficient pixel format and do do something that satisfies our our requirements. Okay, so it seems that you're more interested in power efficient and dropping power efficient pixel format. Uh, but Bernard, are you still interested in power efficient pixel format? Uh, well, or... I think like how like what Harold said, it's you're expressing a general desire towards power efficiency that might include the pixel format or might not. Um, uh, I think a format is a different a kind of a different set of things than than the uh, the hint towards power efficiency. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Tim, you are on the queue. Next. Yeah, I'm just just wondering if we're going to create a new hint. Why is it that way around? Why are we um, why are we going for power efficiency as not the default? Um, that's a great question, and uh, in it. Uh, Initially, I was thinking, yeah, maybe we should uh, use that preset uh, by default. And um, the camera folks, they, they told me, hey, you still need to be uh, a bit cautious if you're planning to support like these bar, uh, bar scanners, like barcode scanners, applications, uh, and so on. Maybe in that case, it's uh, you, you don't want it. Um, so I mean, the, the question would be if get user media is called without that constraint. Uh, I think user agents are free to do what whatever they can. And ideally, uh, I would say yes, we should have power efficient through, but it might be difficult to actually learn that change. So maybe a power efficient will be made to false initially. But um, uh, okay, I, I think that. If I summarize the uh, discussion here, it seems that we could uh, drop power efficient pixel format and maybe have a power efficient constraint and uh, define it in some terms that are a, a little bit looser than power efficient pixel format. Oh, John Lin, yeah. Yeah, so you know, what's the expectation when you have two pages, so one specify power efficient and another page specify uh, non-power efficient? What's the expectation here? Um, at least in terms of implementation, what I would see is that um, uh, on macOS and iOS, you have camera presets with uh, specific definitions. And if they do match, and only what some of them are power efficient. So, and what we have measured is that you can actually, if you go to those presets and then you um, you resize, then you're gaining you're gaining uh, power. 
compared to directly go to uh, these other presets that are exactly matching the resolution. So what would happen is that when you set power efficient to true, you get to, to that and uh, maybe apply a resize uh, info. Uh, so that, that's, what, that's what will probably happen. And uh, as I said, it would be, uh, maybe you will lose a little bit of quality uh, and maybe uh, that's usually good enough for uh, like, if you, my, my criteria would be if it's a long standing, uh, if you're planning to use the camera for a long standing application, then being power efficient too is probably the right thing to do. Uh, if it's just for uh, like a one second, a three second thing or a few minutes, then maybe it does not really matter. And you should okay. go to power efficient ports. That, that's the kind of criteria I would use as a web developer. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just quickly, uh, are you saying that barcode scanning doesn't work with power efficient modes? Um, on some devices, the uh, autofocus is slightly more finicky. So mm -hmm. you can still scan, but if you're very close, maybe it will be a, a little bit harder. It will not be problem. And that's uh, that's one issue I, I, I was made aware. OK. That might be good to include, include as examples, maybe, in the spec. Mm -hmm. We want to specify this. All right, thanks. Um, is it ready for PR then? Or and is, is uh, removal of power, power efficient pixel format also ready for PR? Or should we wait a little bit uh, for some other folks? I think it's okay to make, make a PR for removing it. Then we can okay. discuss that. If nobody comes up to defend it, just land. Sounds good. Or are we really just changing it, its name and function? Yeah, either is fine. Well, we can we can let editors know. Yes, uh, Guido. Um, yes, I think uh, since power efficient pixel format is like more specific, we can start with just a new constraint without necessarily removing the other one, and we can remove the other one if more time passes and no one implements it or no one. But uh, okay. I don't think we need to necessarily replace it from the start. Okay, sounds good. Okay, for, for the notes, are we putting down Guido's suggestion? Uh, so I'm recording, uh, proceed with a pull request to add a power efficient constraint and I recorded Guido's suggestions of leaving the removal for later. Yeah, that works for me. Okay, are we done with this item, UN? Yep, thanks. All right. Okay, we're on to the ICE controller API. Samir. Hi, thank you. Uh, so uh, it's been a while since we talked about uh, the ICE controller API in the working group. So I just want to uh, give a refresher of where we are right now. Uh, so we've settled on a shape of the API that uh, lets the application observe candidate pairs as they are formed, uh, remove them when they might not, no longer be necessary or to prevent the removal by the ICE agent itself and to uh, control the selection of the active candidate pair that's uh, used for transport at the moment. So the next step along the roadmap uh, that we've sketched out uh, is uh, uh, an API that uh, lets the application interact with ICE checks. And uh, this was originally proposed by Peter back in TPAC uh, the last year. Uh, so it's been a while since we talked about it. But uh, I'd like to continue that discussion today and uh, go into a bit more depth uh, into the shape and mechanics of this API. So next slide, please. So to start off a brief uh, 
overview of what an ice check is and uh, in this context, uh, we can use, uh, we can call it interchangeably as a stun check or stun ping, uh, or more specifically a stun binding request. So uh, the purpose of, a, of an ICE check uh, in the case of ICE is, uh, 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 this isn't an exhaustive list, uh, and not all of these are specified in the ICE uh, spec itself. Uh, but uh, these are purposes for which ice checks are used by WebRTC implementations. So there's uh, actually establishing whether a candidate pair uh, provides connectivity if uh, data can actually be exchanged over the pair. Uh, 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 discovering reflexive uh, candidate pair, candidates uh, and learning their priority, and then. Uh, getting ice moving along uh, by determining the role of each of the peers and uh, uh, determining what uh, candidate pair to uh, nominate and use as an active pair and then uh, if turn is being used then uh, stumpings are also used to uh, establish turn allocations permissions and then uh, at least in one case uh, for the actual exchange of data over turn as well uh, and then stumpings are also used to uh, ask keeps al keep alives to keep uh, net pointings or uh, turn allocations uh, refreshed and active. And then finally, this is one specific case uh, that uh, WebRTC implementations uh, use ice checks to determine RTT, and this is exposed uh, through get stats uh, as well in uh, RTC ice candidate pair stats. Uh, Bernard, do you want to? Bring something up before I continue. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask if consent freshness is included in your concept of ice checks here. Uh, yes, I think that's uh, fair. Yeah. Yeah, because that's going to bring up security issues uh, coming forward. But anyway, thanks. Okay, I'll uh, I'll try and address that uh, maybe when uh, once I get to the API itself. Uh, but yeah, let me know if uh, at the end if uh, it isn't uh, answered. Uh, so the API that we want to talk about today, uh, it addresses a subset of these uh, motivations. Uh, we, of course, want to check whether a candidate pair uh, is still connected if uh, we can exchange data over it. Uh, we would like to uh, maintain uh, user checks to uh, keep NAT bindings or turn allocations refreshed and then uh, determine RTT, uh, especially for candidate pairs that are not actively being used for transport to see if uh, that might actually offer a better alternative uh, to switch to, uh, since we have the API now to actually switch transport to a different candidate pair. And then another motivation of the API that isn't really a motivation for ice checks themselves is to limit uh, ice checks in some cases, whether it comes of bandwidth or it comes of power or an alternate uh, pair or an interface that might be more power sensitive. So next slide, please. Right, so what does the proposed API actually uh, allow the application to do? So it uh, gives more visibility into sending and uh, receiving ICE checks and uh, responses. So the application can know when checks are being sent, if uh, the checks are being initiated by the ICE agent, then in some cases, uh, the API lets uh, the application prevent that check from being sent. And if that happens, then the ICE agent uh, basically, uh, typically an ICE agent will send checks at the expiration of some timer. So in this case, the ICE agent won't do anything and just uh, wait until the next timer event. Uh, and uh, there are some category of uh, ICE checks that uh, this API does not let the application prevent, and that's triggered checks in response to uh, the other peer sending checks uh, as described in the ICE spec, or nominations. Nominations are also handled by a different part of the API, so that's not included uh, within the scope of this API itself. Uh, then the API will let the application know when a check response is received, and that might be a success or an error response. And uh, if no response is received, then the application can know when a check has timed out. Uh, and then uh, the API will also let uh, the application initiate a nice check by itself. Uh, so this will be uh, a check that isn't uh, initiated by the ICE agent. Uh, 
there are some specific things that the CPI will not let an application uh, do. And first of all, uh, first and foremost, it won't prevent the ICE agent from responding to ICE checks. So that uh, must still happen if uh, there is connectivity. Uh, then the current API does not uh, uh, allow the application to actually craft a stun packet. So it cannot change the method or uh, change, uh, set any of the stun attributes within the stun packet itself. And then it does not uh, allow the application to bypass any security mitigations uh, that are in the specs, such as rate limiting. So it won't let, uh, for instance, an application flood uh, the network with uh, uh, stun packets. Uh, Bernard? Yeah, so I wanted to ask specifically for uh, consent freshness, uh, which of these constraints apply? So I like that you're not bypassing the security mitigations, but I'm wondering if uh, consent freshness is considered a trigger check. Um, I like that you you can't prevent the response, so you're gonna always get the consent freshness response. But sh should the app be able to stop consent freshness requests from going out? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a good point. I do not know off the top of my head if it is a trigger check or not, but if it isn't, then I'll uh, take a note to myself to uh, include that as something that the application cannot prevent. Yeah, I, I think that would address uh, the security issue. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Yanibar? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I'm just looking ahead on the slides and it seems to go into detail on the API, so I just want to ask early uh, now we're, we seem to be into the how, but it's still not clear to me uh, what the what an application, why would an application want to control when and where checks are sent? Why would an application want to prevent checks from being sent and, and interfere basically in this way since the application is the one that set up all the I servers and provided all the info? Uh, it's still not clear to me how a JavaScript would you know, how would these APIs be used to what end? Right. Uh, so uh, some of these uh, details are in the write-up that I've uh, added, uh, I've created an issue on GitHub, uh, issue 209, if I remember correctly, uh, that goes into uh, more motivations and some more details, but to give a brief overview. So once an active candidate pair is selected and uh, the peers are exchanging data over that pair, uh, there are stun checks that are still sent uh, on that pair for keep lives, uh, roughly every two seconds or so. But then any other candidate pairs that might have been retained, uh, those are not uh, checked more than roughly once every 15 seconds or so. And now that we are allowing the application to actually switch to a different candidate pair for transport, this API's aim is to let the applications make sure that the term, that some other candidate pair is actually still valid. Uh, it can still be used to exchange data and to get some sense of the quality of different candidate pair. And that's primarily based on RTT. So whether it would actually help uh, give a better user experience by switching to a different candidate pair, let's say if the RTT is a lot lower, uh, this is something we've uh, tried out uh, on mobile, not quite on web yet, of course, uh, but uh, based on the network interfaces that uh, are available to an application, uh, we've seen vastly different RTDs in different cases. And so it might, uh, uh, the network conditions might gradually evolve over the course of a nice session, or we might start out with one network interface, whereas some, something else comes up. Uh, that uh, might actually be a better option, or even if you're on Wi-Fi, your Wi-Fi might degrade, and so you might want to switch to something else, but you want to get a sense of uh, whether there will be any improvement by switching to a different uh, network path. And so that's what uh, we're trying to achieve with the CPI. Okay, I just want to clarify if the motivation there is that the user agent isn't doing a good enough job today, and how much of this API surface could be reduced if it were to do a better job? I, I, I what, uh, what are the reasons to believe the application? Because you're asking the application to take on a lot of responsibility. So I, I'm assuming that there's no other way for the user agent to do that uh, without knowing the application domain. 
Right. So uh, as the spec exists today, uh, I do not believe the user agent has any obligation to actually do anything different if, let's say, the RTT, if your Wi-Fi network degrades but doesn't actually completely disconnect. Uh, there is nothing that says that the user agent must still continue to find better candidate pairs or switch transport to something else. And so there's, un unless uh, you encounter an ICE disconnect, in which case uh, there'll be some retries or there might be an ICE restart and then you start the entire ICE session all over again. There is nothing that actually the user agent has to do to try and uh, give the user a better uh, connectivity. And so, there's nothing that exists today that would uh, proactively allow switching to a different candidate pair or try and find a better alternative. But if there were was a pair connection configuration option, for example, or on the ICE transport that said, please, you know, actively look for other candidate pairs, we could reduce a lot of API potentially. Yeah. Uh, 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 I I think we could, uh, my, my sense is we would have to be possibly a bit more specific about how to, uh, how to go about choosing an alternative. And uh, for instance, in some cases, you may or may not want to use a relay server because that might possibly add latency or, uh, <laughs> Basically, I think what I'm trying to get to is the configuration would might actually grow to the size that would uh, be comparable to an additional API surface itself. Uh, Harald, is that uh, something you wanted to comment on or should I stick to the queue? So uh, just on, just on uh, why, we had this discussion and in, uh, in, the, in the beginning when Samir started this, uh, conversation. Basically, the UA cannot know everything. In particular, the UA cannot know what options the application might have available that are not Im immediately visible. So the purpose of this uh, API is, is uh, to allow the application to control uh, uh, the use, use of connections and to figure out the information that the tech can get. So uh, the user agent algorithm has to have to have to evolve reasonably slowly, and they have to be adapted so that uh, they do a good job in the general case. So. Uh, these APIs will allow experimentation, will allow consideration of things that the user agent cannot know. And so it's a general, it's, it's a movement in a general direction of uh, ensuring that we can, uh, that uh, the application can can do what, what it want to, wants to do while keeping the status that uh, that if the application doesn't want to control it, things should work reasonably well anyway. Right. Uh, Peter, sorry to skip around you. Uh... It's okay, I was going to uh, reply to what Bernard was asking about other earlier about the consent checks. I think that it would be fine if the application could disable ICE checks altogether and not including consent checks but what would happen is that if you don't get consent check responses then basically the ice transport goes disconnected and you can't use it anymore so it's kind of like uh you can do it if you want but you just will end up with an unusable connection so i don't think it's unsafe it's just yeah a little bit of a foot gun i guess and uh i'd since you had this discussion about the why, I, I just want to say that uh, I think Harold and Samir did a good job of describing why it would be very difficult to expect the UA to know everything that the application would want to do. And that if we were to make a configuration capable of uh, expressing everything, it would be very complicated. All right. 
if uh, slow comments at this stage, I can move ahead. Next slide, please. Right, so uh, now we're going a bit more into the what of the API itself. So as I mentioned, there's an issue on GitHub, issue 209, where I have a, uh, apologies for a fairly lengthy write-up uh, of uh, the shape of the API itself. Uh, and uh, there's two options that are presented. Uh, the first one is uh, basically the option that was presented at TPAC last year uh, by Peter. And then the second one is uh, a, a variation of that that uh, adheres a bit more to the uh, typical event-based APIs that uh, we have. Uh, but there are pros and cons of both of these, which I'll get to. Uh, in retrospect, I should probably have just called this uh, promise-based and event-based uh, API shapes. Uh, so I'll try and uh, stick with to that terminology uh, going forward. Uh, but essentially, both of these options follow the same structure, which uh, sort of goes uh, through the life, uh, sorry, the life cycle of an ICE check. So either the ICE agent or the application initiates uh, an ICE check by determining what candidate pair it wants to send that check over. Uh, that's step one. Step two is to actually send out the ICE check. And then from the point of view of a peer, step three would be to receive a response to that check uh, or uh, after, some, after some time to uh, encounter a timeout and uh, conclude uh, that check over there. So the promise-based approach, uh, in this case, there is an event if the ICE agent decides to initiate an ICE check. Otherwise, uh, if the application is doing that, then you get a promise uh, as a result of that call. But then after that first event, you get a promise, which is resolved. Uh, you basically get sequences of promises that resolve as the check goes through each step in its life cycle. So first, a check is uh, sent, uh, or you, a check is initiated. That gives you a promise, which is resolved when the check is actually sent out. And then uh, from that promise, you get the request that was sent out. And then that request contains another promise, which resolves when you get a response or a timeout. And so that's the end of the lifecycle. In case of the event-based API, this. Uh, there's just events that are triggered uh, at different stages of uh, the ICE check. So there's one event that triggers when uh, an ICE check is being initiated. And then there's another event that's triggered once everything concludes. So uh, it's, uh, it's sort of a more lightweight uh, API in the sense that there isn't as much state within each event. But then it also uh, comes with some limitations, which I'll get to in a second. So if we could go to the next slide. Next, yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, what the idea looks like. There's quite a lot of text here. Uh, you don't need to read all of that right now. It's all in the write-up on the issue. Uh, but as you can see on the left in the promise-based API, there is uh, an event uh, that the application can cancel if it doesn't want a check to be sent out. Uh, if it goes ahead, then you get a promise with a request. That request has another promise with a response. And uh, at the conclusion, you get a response with the timestamp. So from the request and the response timestamps, you can determine the RTD of the rise check. On the right, in the event-based API, there is one event which can be canceled uh, if uh, the application wants to prevent a check. And then there's another event at the conclusion which contains both the sent and the save timestamps. And so the RTT can, uh, uh, can be computed from that single event. Uh, so now the difference uh, between these two approaches uh, uh, this fairly, which is fairly subtle, is if we want uh, if we want to have rate limits and make sure that we don't let the application spam stun checks, then there has to be a certain interval between one check being sent and another check being sent. 
with the promise-based approach, it doesn't matter if a check was initiated by the application or by the ICE agent. In both cases, the application knows exactly when a check will have been sent out based on uh, the promise resolving. And so the application can ensure that uh, an adequate duration has passed before sending out another check. Uh, so it shouldn't really uh, cause a failure uh, in the check, uh, can, check and check pair method because it tried to send out uh, stem checks too quickly. That is, of course, unless the uh, app is trying to abuse that API. But uh, if it is uh, sticking to the rules and keeping enough interval, then there's no reason for uh, that method to fail. In the case of the event-based API, there isn't an event or some there isn't an event that tells you when a check was actually sent, if it was initiated by the ICE agent. And so there is a small chance that uh, the application will encounter a failure because it uh, sent out uh, a check uh, too soon after the ICE agent sent out a check itself. Uh, but again, of course, if the application is trying not to abuse the API and keep enough interval, then it can retry that check and uh, hopefully it'll be sent out again. So that's one sort of subtle difference between the two approaches. Uh, that I've, I've tried to explain this in the write-up as well. So uh, hopefully it uh, helps to understand that. Uh, Next slide has an example of uh, what a, an application might look like in either of these cases. So again, it looks uh, pretty similar. The key difference is in case of the promise-based API, uh, that sort of follows along the course of a single check by chaining uh, promises uh, one after the other, whereas in the case of event-based API, there's some more flat structure to the code and uh, uh, yeah, otherwise it's uh, fairly minor differences. Tim. Yeah, um, so uh, it seems to me that there's quite a big difference in terms of what the, what is in scope, what, what the, the context of the, um, the context that the application will see around the event seems to be quite different because with the promise will carry a lot of context with it and the event won't and so specifically the application won't know if the response it's reading it's looking at the received event um, is one that it triggered or not like it's unaware of that whereas in the first api it will know that right um, seems to me that that would be that would be a useful thing to have to be able to like associate something with the event, either a, a, an optional data field or or something that that would. So when you got a check back, you'd know whether it was one that you'd triggered or or one that had been triggered by the system. Right. So uh, I did. Uh mention one this limitation on one of the previous slides, except I realized later that the application can know uh, what initiated the check because there's only one outstanding check at any given time. So if the application tries to send a check while the ICE agent has already sent out a check and waiting for a response, or if the application itself has previously sent a response, uh, the check method will fail. And so based on that, uh, the application can put enough uh, data together to figure out uh, the response that it receives, uh, what was uh, the source of that event. So there's only one check per pair in flight, is what you're uh, saying? For a given candidate pair, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so you could deduce yeah, I mean, you can work out whether it's probably you, but it's still less tidy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. There was, uh, uh, if I recall, so, uh, so there's another uh, small change that can be done to the event-based API to resolve this. So right now, the check candidate pair method returns an uh, empty promise. 
but uh, the promise could resolve to the transaction ID of this stun check itself that was sent out. And then the transaction ID is included in the event that you get at the conclusion. And so you can tie those together to, for a more tidy, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like that. I don't think there's any, I'm just trying to wonder whether there's a like security issue about, because the transaction ID is actually um, in the clear. It's unencrypted, so you're actually sending. You know, you now know something that was sent unencrypted, but maybe that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I think Yanivar is next. Thank you. Uh, yes. So uh, we're we're getting a little bit into the details here, almost like a PR review here. But um, there's a couple couple of comments now that RTC ice candidate appears an interface. I'm wondering if you, which I think was not the case when we last looked at this, I'm wondering if you considered having a check method on the Canada pair interface itself. Um, as far as promise, I also have some questions. What is read-only attribute array buffer transaction ID? Right, so uh, I think this was something that came up uh, the previous uh, uh, the previous equation, this was presented as well. So the transaction ID is the transaction ID in the stun check itself. Uh, if I recall correctly, Peter, if you want to add anything to that. Sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, so this was a transaction ID uh, in the uh, either the event or in the promise response. Uh, what is the transaction ID and why is it an array buffer? Oh, the transaction ID is just 20 bytes that's in the stun yeah. header. And it's useful for debugging because mm -hmm. uh, it's very common that when you're debugging ICE with an endpoint that is a server or a native endpoint, you look at logs and see transaction IDs and you're like, what happened to that ICE check? I don't know. So it's really useful to know what the transaction ID is. And each check has its own unique transaction ID. OK. All right, cool. Um, so uh, as far as, so what's, let me first comment on what's common here is that there's a proposal for a check method, basically, that will uh, resolve a promise when uh, the user agent has performed a stun check on behalf of the application and or happened to be doing that recently anyway, or is it specifically an extra stun check? And what happens if an application calls this in a loop, basically? Like, can you spam? This is causing network spam. Right. So uh, RAID limiting is specifically called out. So the uh, ICE RFC limits uh, checks on the active candidate pair to once every 50 seconds. Uh, but of course, user agents are free to have a larger interval uh, between uh, requirement as well. Uh, and for the specific use case itself, uh, which is to the main use case is to determine RDT on inactive uh, candidate pairs, anything of the order of uh, one second is an adequate interval and should prevent uh, spamming or, uh, yeah. So in what's on the left here versus the right, is it purely API differences, or is there any functional difference in the two? Yeah. So it is purely an API difference. The only functional difference is the application doesn't know if a nice check was initiated by the ICE agent. In that case, when was the check actually sent out? And so it might have some trouble maintaining an adequate gap from that so as to not hit into the rate limit. That's the only uh, uh, piece of information missing in the event-based API, as far as I'm OK, so yeah, yeah I, I would lean toward the left end just as a PR feedback um, in, in that I think on the right hand, uh, you're having an awful lot of, uh, like the general W3C advice, tag advice there for events is to not put a lot of state in events. And here we have a lot of state. So that tells me that the promise approach might be better uh, just purely if, if you're seeking feedback on left versus right here, I think mm -hmm. left is probably more uh, in line with uh, general API advice. Yeah, that's good. 
uh, Peter. Uh, I think you're muted, Peter. Whoops, thanks. Um, yeah. You said that there would only be one ice check in flight at a time for giving candidate pair? Uh, yep. Uh, so if an ice check goes lost, is there going to be like a fixed timeout that the browser thinks it's no longer in flight? Uh, yeah, so uh, the ICE agent is putting the candidate pair into in-progress state to when uh, it sends out the check. Uh, and then either at the conclusion of the check, when it well, it gets a response, it puts it into completed, if I recall correctly. Uh, and in the case of timeout, it uh, might be uh, failed, if I remember. And so it's going to do that uh, once it times out. And then once it's no longer an in-progress state, then it can send out another check. Well, I think there are uh, kind of two problems with that approach. One is that it doesn't allow the application to decide what it thinks the timeout for a given check should be. Uh, and the other is that we really do want more than one check in flight at a time for a given candidate pair in many instances. Like um, that's generally how initial connectivity works as you send, because you don't know what the RTT is gonna be. So you just send them basically as fast as you can uh, with the limitation of uh, that's pointed out in the spec um, every, I think it was 20 milliseconds. Um, so as long as the browser is enforcing a global uh, rate limit across all checks, then I think it's safe to let the application send more than one check at a time for a given candidate pair so it can have more control over what it thinks the timeout should be, given that you don't know the RTT before you send the first one, or before you get back uh, the first response. Right. Yeah. Oh, last feedback on uh, left versus right here. Uh, the general advice for events is to keep them uh, thin and put uh, the attributes instead on the event target. So I'm wondering again if you've considered now that candidate pairs and interface maybe some of these attributes, uh, if they're if if you only care about the last value, it could maybe be an attribute on the pair itself, or if it's specific to the standard request. I don't know. So uh, the attributes uh, would, I think, just keeping attributes on the interface itself would be fairly close to what we can do with get stats because with get stats we can get the current rtd which is a uh, uh, mm -hmm. most recent measurement and then an aggregate of the total rtd measured over all the stun checks and the number of checks that were sent out to get mm -hmm. an average uh but i think it's more useful and a more powerful api to actually uh provide immediate feedback once we receive the response itself uh, and so i think with the uh, sort of a compromise of uh, having promises within the event is probably a good approach to keep the event slight, but also to provide more information uh, faster than what would be possible with get starts. All right, cool. So uh, things like sent time, for instance, that's the time when the user agent uh, put it on the network. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. And we're we're starting to run out of time for this, or we have run out of time for this item. Yeah, so uh, what I hear is uh, the left approach is better, more uh, compliant uh, with the advice, and uh, to think a bit more about uh, whether it's OK and uh, feasible to allow the application to actually set a timeout and to have, have multiple stun packets in flight, stand, or ice checks in flight at a given time. Uh, so I'll take that back. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, it's me here. All right, so um, yes, we have a couple of issues for OpenTC PC and main, or one each. The first one is that uh, there's some fuzzy language. Well, <clears throat> it's actually clear language in the spec right now, but it's saying something that has some uh, profound uh, uh, consequences that are a little surprising. 
the spec right now says that if you, because in JavaScript, you can basically, every time you have an, uh, a platform object, you can hold on a reference to it, excuse me, and then you can inspect it later. Um, and what the current spec says that uh, the local description object is an interface, uh, RTC session description, and uh, it can be object compared uh, later. So you can have X equals local description, and you can also set say Y equals its SDP, which is a, a string on that object. And then um, later you add it, uh, you either get on ice candidate or you add an ice candidate and an ice candidate has been added to the description now. So the current spec says that, well, the local description doesn't change, but it's SDC pre, it, but it's SDP string does. And that does not match what any implementations are doing. Uh, implementations instead are actually assigning a new interface to PC.local description that contains the new SDP. And the previous object, if you held on to it, you would not see its SDP string change. So the, propo the proposal here is basically to align with implementations and change the spec. Any objections? All right, I think that was sufficient time to establish no objections. Um, so I think this is ready for PR. We can go to the next slide. All right, so uh, this is issue 966 in Media Capture main, uh, which we discussed last time. We discussed the issue is uh, pretty long. Should device change fire when the device info changes? Um, so to narrow down on just what we talked about last meeting, I presented a new device inserted event, but there was no appetite for it. And instead, people suggested to extend the existing event, the device change event. Uh, we uh, something probably more than a boolean would be re required for this. So here's that proposal. It's basically to so just a refresher. If you haven't looked at device change event uh, in a bit, uh, it actually has an attribute, a frozen array of the information from a numeric devices in the event that was added a, a couple of months back. So the proposal here is to uh, basically add a sibling that contains only the user inserted devices. Next slide. So the user inserted devices, which is again a frozen array of media devices, returns an array containing only those media device info objects from devices, meaning they're object comparable, that the user physically inserted or activated recently and are newly exposed with this event as a result, otherwise empty. So the, the purpose here is to that a user inserting a device during or even immediately ahead of a call can be a strong signal that they wish to use that device immediately. So we want to encourage applications here to rely on this attribute because it better disambiguates this signal from uh, differences in devices that might happen from changes in device information exposure. So basically, the problem here was that the existing device change event left it to JavaScript to determine whether any new devices were inserted or not, which can be problematic for headset detection or speaker uh, or microphone. If I if I basically plug in a USB microphone into my laptop, um, that's a strong signal that you, I might want to use it. But if I were, but there are a lot of races now where device information exposure in the spec is quite limited ahead of call and get user media, which means that ahead of get user media, will, you will only see uh, that you have a camera or a microphone, but no, no more information than that, not multiple or and not labels. So when get user media is called, uh, the information from a number of devices will be very different. It will have a lot of information. And some uh, browsers are even changing out fake devices for real devices and causing uh, enumerate devices to look very different. And it becomes very hard for the JavaScript application to tell, oh, hold on, were all these microphones just inserted? Or did I just get uh, uh, additional 
privilege of seeing that information. So a way to solve this would be to have uh, to, a way to solve this head on would just be to provide that information directly. Another advantage here is that the user agent could actually then include a device the user inserted or turned on right before get user media was called. Something that's not possible today. And provided uh, that it wasn't exposed, because if this is the first time the application calls get user media. Um, let me explain it this way. I, I rush into my meeting, I plug in my device or I open my AirPods and uh, I'm actually racing now with the application call and get user media. <clears throat> uh, but then with this caveat here, we're allowing user agents to still include this device in the user inserted devices category, uh, even though uh, regardless of whether I inserted it right before get user media or right after. Uh, provided that uh, this is the first time this device is being exposed, um, it doesn't matter whether uh, I'm seeing it for the first time because of uh, device information exposure or whether uh, device insertion happened after that. And that's the proposal. Discuss, Tim. So, how about Maybe it's simpler to think about most recently inserted device. That kind of does the same yes. sort of thing, but it, it, it means that you don't really care when it happened. Well, there, there's some timing element to it, right? I mean, uh, it has to be, in order for it to be strong signal, it has to be somewhat recent. Um, and also it can be multiple devices, right? Because here we consider a microphone, because my AirPods are both microphones, both both a microphone and a, and a um, sorry, that's a bad example. Let's say I plug in a, a, a camera that has both a camera and a, a microphone on it. So if I plug in my Logitech Brio or whatever, then I might want to use both its camera and microphone. And so there would be two devices inserted. That's why it's an array. So that's a good clarification moment. Okay. Um, but you're saying recent, most recent. Um, yeah, I, I like that we're bike shedding. Um, that's something we could uh, discuss on the issue too, I guess. Anyone think this is not a good idea? And, and Tim, were you thinking about uh, by that name change? Were you suggesting a slightly different logic or the same logic? I was really thinking that, given that you struggled to explain the behavior, maybe there was something wrong with the name. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, I hope. Uh, well, I'm always open to bike shed. I think inserted implies a physical thing that isn't always mapping reality anymore as people don't necessarily always use wired devices so but i've still felt that uh, inserted is uh, something that carries some understanding of uh, i want to use this now it's sort of like a keyboard press uh, that plugging something in and and uh, we've often considered that to be equivalent to the use of pressing a key on a keyboard for example be yeah, happy to back should uh harold yeah, just one wondering. Uh, is a new new feature, and uh, so how do you feature detect whether whether the lack of user inserted devices is because nothing has been inserted or because uh, uh, this feature isn't implemented? Uh, yes, yeah, a good question. It, it would be always present, and it would be an empty array. Okay, cool. that works. All right. Um, I'm not hearing any objections. So, ready for PR? Well, there is a PR here, but uh, we can bike shed uh, on it and uh, propose magic. I think that's it. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, we've reached the end of the agenda. And I think in this part, we maybe just want to make sure we understand we didn't miss any uh, notes or next steps that we, uh, particularly, I guess, the chairs need to take. Uh, is there anything that comes to mind, Harold or Yanivar? Follow up things. Uh, since since we won't have a July meeting, you know, I guess our next meeting will be August. So we want to make sure we don't drop any walls or anything for next month. I didn't hear any any chair actions, but a number of uh, proposal actions to and get things ready for PR. OK. Yeah, that's my recollection, too. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. So we'll, re we'll read Dom's note with it, notes with interest and see. OK. Yeah, so for everybody's uh, information, our next meeting will be on August 27th. So if you want time on the agenda, please uh, let the chairs know. And then, of course, after that, uh, we'll. our goal, actually, for August 27th is to get any kind of the more uh, regular or, or uh, things in in August so we can spend feedback thinking about bigger stuff. Um, and also, if you are you have a topic for TPAC, please let us know so we can set the agenda there as well. OK, unless there's any other uh, business, I think we're done for the month. Thanks, everybody. OK, the recording now stops. <laughs>